Hiya! Paint with Truth here, and on this episode of Otaku Evolution, I want to talk a little bit about 15ing. 15ing was a technique used in the UK to get anime releases to a rating for older viewers by adding coarse language to the script in English dubs. This had the function of differentiating anime titles from animation for younger children that didn't tackle as sophisticated subject material or had as much graphic violence. A higher rating meant children wouldn't be exposed to material many in the West would deem inappropriate. A lot of manga entertainment dubs, and in a few other cases dubs for other licensors, were done in the UK. As it is, there aren't really swear words in Japanese per se. It's mostly just rudeness via informal speech or familiar tones to those above your station or older than you. Japanese words like Kisama are just very blunt informal ways of saying you and are usually translated into curse words in English. Some anime doves are able to do this with flair or restraint and others are Cyber City 08808. This is bullshit. Why hasn't my sentence been reduced? Correction, because you deliberately disobeyed Hasegawa's orders, your sentence has now been increased by 10 years and 6 months to 315 years and 2 months. Why, you bureaucratic shithead? Oh, let it go, Sengoku. You'll never be able to talk him out of it. I agree with Benton. At least we saved the skyscraper and that prick Hasegawa didn't pop our heads off with these fucking collars, so don't bother getting so steamed up over another 10 years. Go fuck yourself, Gogol. Really, in some ways, it's the 15ing that makes Cyber City Oeda worth watching. Otherwise, it's kinda... eh. Some good concepts done very little with. Like Goku Midnight Eye. Only instead of being based on a manga, this one's an original work. It just seems like it takes place in the, uh, Goku-verse? Whatever. I mean, it's the same blanket cyber future. Cyber City 08808 is about three criminals so heinous that they've been locked up in an orbiting prison for multiple life sentences. And by multiple, I mean basically forever. But one day, they're given the option to return to the world below on the condition that they work off their crimes as police officers, shortening their sentences with each criminal apprehended. Of course, they're kept on a leash, an explosive collar placed on each so that they don't get cute or go AWOL. I guess it's taking a page out of John Ostrander's Suicide Squad comics. Instead of, you know, the movie nobody wants to talk about or the movie everyone probably should have seen instead. There's the antisocial rude and generally the problem child of the group Sengoku, constantly being monitored and supervised by a robot named Varsis. He's got a terrible attitude about the work and hates the boss most out of all of them. But despite being kind of a bad egg, he isn't without his own sense of honor or decency. The first of the three episodes focuses on him. Gogol, which I think should be pronounced Goggles, May be the brawniest of the bunch, but he's actually an A-class hacker, respected by the underworld. He's pretty casual and doesn't like to make waves like Sengoku, but when he gets riled up, he's pretty dangerous. He's the main protagonist of Part 2. Finally, there's the androgynous Benton, with rock star hair. He seems to be obsessed with the position of stars and fate. Despite his pretty boy good looks and gentle facade, he could be one cold bastard. He's the most likely to follow orders out of the three, but even he has his breaking point. The final episode is his adventure. Of course, there's also Hasegawa, their leash holder and all-around hard-ass. In Japanese, he's played by Norio Wakamoto, so you know he's intimidating, even if he looks like Toguro's manager from Yu Yu Hakusho. Well, it must be quite a gadget. Oh yes, it's quite a gadget, all right. Your bunch of collar-wearing criminal dogs will soon be back in prison where they belong, and I give you fair warning, you're going to be out of a job. We'll see, won't we? I hope this machine of yours is better than your computer. Gogol broke into that. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't take this contraption of yours, smash it into a thousand pieces, and stuff them up your ass. Well, my goodness. There's something to look forward to. The first episode sees our group of drafted deviants at a colossal skyscraper whose computers have taken on a life of their own, trapping some on the higher floors, including an officer they're familiar with. While Gogol and Benton try to finesse their way up, Sengoku just tries to smash his way to the top. 
There, he encounters the man who designed much of the building, holed up in his office. He informs our hero that it must be the work of his old business partner. Only problem is, his old business partner is dead. Because he killed him. Well, that particular bit doesn't come out so freely at first. <sighs> well, I never. The goddamn fingerprint lock actually works on this thing. You know, I've just thought of a very interesting experiment to try with this gun. Let's see if it still recognizes my fingerprints. Don't worry if the gun goes off, you ain't gonna know fuck all about it. Hey, you can't shoot me! Remember, you're a policeman! I'm not a cop. I'm just a cyber criminal doing a little bit of community service. He eventually confesses to murdering his partner, but it seems like the stiff's mind is somehow hanging on and is in the computer's systems. With a literal ghost in the machine, Sengoku is determined to put an end to it before people get killed. Hasegawa, on the other hand, wants his puppet to hand out an execution to the murderer. Sengoku isn't wild about the notion at the moment, as he has a score to settle with a dead guy. So this time I'm downloading you straight into hell. <laughs> Unfortunately for Sengoku, Hasegawa is still sore about him ignoring his order, and more time is added to his sentence, pissing him off something fierce. Even the prospect of a hot date isn't enough to calm his nerves, and he intends to take his complaint to management. Assuming the next two episodes take place after that one, I guess Sengoku didn't kill Hasegawa or vice versa. Maybe he just embedded that jite into his desk like he was leaving an upper decker in the guy's bathroom. Ah well. Our next episode sees Gogol catching up with a rogue police draftee in the midst of an attempt to disable his collar. Google's supposed to arrest him, but he can't help watching to see if he might be free of his, too. Unfortunately, things don't go as planned, so he relaxes in his van with some Russian literature. Only, he has a guest, a former partner in crime named Sarah, who the military are keen on finding. Seems that she got her hands on some classified info about a new weapon, a souped-up cyborg. Sarah makes a good show of fighting off the army's pursuit of them, but soon reveals that she's actually been in league with them this whole time. The goal was to recruit Gogol to test out the power of the cyborg. Feeling sentimental, Sarah attempts to help Gogol out, ramming the death machine with the van, but to no avail, and she drowns. All right, big man, hold it right there. You're under arrest for aiding and abetting a criminal. Perhaps I should say an ex-criminal. Pity she was so cute. You monster. You know full well she'd never get out of this alive. You fucking murdered her, you shit. I'm surprised you care about her. Particularly after she stitched you up. Still, there are plenty more fish in the sea, so don't distress yourself too much. Anyway, enough about women. The Cyborg Project is a big to-do for the military to replace the cyber police with these reanimated corpses with cybernetics and artificial psychic power. I fail to see how that's any more cost-efficient than drafting lifers, and I can't imagine it's any safer either. But now Gogol is left high up in what seems to be Tokyo Tower, where he's to fight the new weapon. He's, um, uh, not as prepared as one should be to fight that thing. Let's see, references, references, what do I go with here? The climactic battle in the satellite cradle from Goldeneye? The fight in the deck of Tokyo Tower in the first Tenchi movie? Ooh, I know, the final battle in X the movie. And eh, no, that sucked. Wait, wait. Oh, oh, oh!
What? Is that the best I can do? Fuck, man! Well, I guess I'll link to my review of that in the description. And don't forget to contribute to my- Hey, hey, wait! This Thanksgiving, pause to reflect on what's most important. Family, friends, and... Fruitimals. Fruitimals by Lucky Squid Studios. Delightful Fruit Animal Hybrid Plushies, Orange Fox, Octo Cherry, and Eggplantipus. It's a cornucopia of cuteness. This several course meal is served on Store Envy and Society 6. So stuff the stuffing, deny the pie. The main course this year is Fruitimals. Fruitimals! Nutritious for your hug diet. Gogol gets a little assistance from Sengoku and Benton, who pick him up in an aircraft. He doesn't look good at this point, but Hasegawa insists that he continue fighting. This is an order that Gogol agrees with, but it doesn't look like he's likely to win. Firing missiles at the thing doesn't do much, and Gogol ends up crashing into the tower. But in getting his ass kicked, he picks up on the thing's vulnerability to sound waves and vibrations, and uses it to his advantage. Then he beats the damn machine to death. And when the smug underling of the Chrome Dome shows up to finish him, he hands him his walking papers. That general guy in charge is going to have to issue a full-throated apology. And so the episode ends. I felt like the entire episode was basically just an excuse to have that fight at the tower, because everything before just felt rote and by the numbers. Still, the animation holds up for the most part, so it looks pretty damn good, and that distracts from some of its faults. Some, but not all. Our third and final episode sees the latest in a rash of attacks on scientists that work for a certain medical group. This guy who looks like Cornelius from Planet of the Apes is done in in a bloody way, and Benton investigates. This is the third one with neck wounds like this. I have to conclude. We think we're dealing with a supernatural being, most likely a mummy. As a precaution, I've ordered the Egyptian wing of the Springfield Museum destroyed. <laughs> nice work, Ed. It's a vampire. Vampires are make-believe, just like elves, gremlins, and Eskimos. Hey, Benton, don't crap your pants if you see a vampire out there. Get lost. You wouldn't recognize a goddamn vampire if one jumped up and bit you on the end of your fucking dick. Benton questions the head of the medical facility about the deaths, but he claims that he fired them for having previous criminal records. When asked about what they were researching, the old coot only says that it was perfectly legitimate. Always a good sign. Sorting out that the number written at the crime scene could match a cryogenic patient, our wild-haired hero makes his way up to the space platform the facility's space elevator leads to. While investigating the cryonics lab, he's attacked by cyborg saber-toothed tigers. You know, as is common. Thanks to some quick thinking and his multi-purpose monofilament wire, Benton just barely avoids what I imagine would be the most interesting death ever but allowing the wrinkled guy to think he didn't. Gogol lets Benton in on information on the thing the victims were working on when they were killed. It's a real doozy. It's a genetic code for a virus. It changes the cell structure so it constantly regenerates. In other words, it's a super virus for immortality. Huh, sounds like Nobel Prize material. Well, not quite. It has side effects. The first is it stimulates a person's cerebral cortex to bring out their latent psychic powers. So someone taking this stuff would be able to levitate themselves and float in through an upper story tower block window? Of course. However, side effect number two is much less useful. The virus interferes with the function of the blood's hemoglobin. An infected person will therefore need a new supply, which means they have to drink fresh blood. Of course they do. It turns out that there was some extra data with the body of Cornelius, and Gogol is still analyzing it. In the meantime, Benton finds himself challenged to a duel by one of the medical group's boss's lackeys, 
with whom Benton shares a past. Brigitte Nielsen here at least likes to play things fairly, but maybe she should have cheated because Rock Hare wins the duel. It also turns out that the girl whose cryonics capsule he was investigating was the same one he encountered previously while musing about the stars. She was the medical boss's test subject for the vampire virus, a patient suffering from a disease for which she was frozen until a cure could be found. She resents being made immortal. Benton makes his way to the medical facility again to confront the boss, but Sengoku has been ordered to take him in for ignoring orders and aiding the girl, a suspect. Before they can fight, however, Gogol arrives. He gives Benton a jite with the cure for the virus in it. It was something that the three scientists were working on before they died. The girl, Remy, gets to the evil codger before Benton does. She's there to put an end to him out of anger for being forced to live as a vampire. However, unfortunately for her, the withered old prune has injected the virus into himself, which makes him young and powerful. He uses the opportunity to make her his first feeding. Benton arrives to fight him, but he finds that it's not so easy to get the jite into him. I'm going to suck every last drop of your blood. Count Dushula here has got some moves. Even getting trapped in an airlock and released out into space, while inconvenient, is only a minor obstacle to him, as he reconstitutes himself. For a moment, Benton seems well and truly screwed, but... Now it's time I put you out of my misery. still clinging to life begrudgingly, and so Benton does her a solid and puts her in a capsule and shoots her out into space like it was the end of Wrath of Khan. And that was Cyber City 080808, folks. It was, well, kind of fun, I guess, but also pretty stone stupid and overreaching where it aims higher than the caliber of writing can take it. I suppose even anime I really cherish, like Bubblegum Crisis, does the same thing, but this just doesn't have the charm that does. It's not a waste of time, though. You should probably watch it at least once and make up your own mind about it. I guess what I'm saying about Kawajiri's works is, well, they're stylish, right? Which brings us to the next episode's subject, just one of three parts of a whole. That's right, Kawajiri's Running Man short. Until then, see ya! <laughs> what a fucking mess. A whole city out of control and all because some shit for brains computer got hijacked. What's that saying? To make a mistake is human, but to really fuck things up, you need a computer. Ain't that right, shithead? The building's computer and myself have been designed and built by humans. Therefore, we inherit their faults. Ha. Huh. Well, you're sure as hell right there. Between the two of us, we can screw up the whole world. I'm just surprised it's taken this long. <laughs>